I bet you're using artificial intelligence on a daily basis. We all are. But have you ever thought how you as a service design professional can contribute to the development of these AI technologies? Well, there's a lot you can do and that's what you learn in this video. Here's the guest for this episode. Let the show begin. Hi, I'm Jillian Powers. This is The Service Design Show, episode 156. Hi, my name is Mark Fontaine and welcome back to another episode of The Service Design Show. On this show, we explore what's beneath the surface of service design. What are those hidden and invisible things that make all the difference between success and failure all to help you design great services that have a positive impact on people, business, and our planet. Our guest in this episode is Jillian Powers. She describes herself as a passionate evangelist for ethical and humane technology, data-driven operations, and digital experiences. She's currently the global head of Responsible AI at Cognizant. The reason I'm excited to have Jillian on the show today is because AI is already all around us. Whether you're using text prediction in your favorite email app or applying filters on your photos, you're already using some form of AI. These AI applications have been designed with a lot of care to make sure that they do no harm, hopefully. Now, text prediction and applying filters to your photos is nice, but things really start to change when AI is used to make high stake judgment calls. Will you get that job? Will you get that medical treatment? Will you get that insurance? And mind you, these are already scenarios where AI is used today. According to Jillian, service design professionals need to get involved in the development process of AI applications sooner than later. Because when that development is driven by technology as it is today, rather than human needs, things can go wrong, really wrong. So if you stick around till the end of the conversation, you'll know what is this AI thing anyway? How can you contribute to the development process even when you're not working for a big tech company? And finally, how to make a convincing argument that gets you in the right conversations. If you enjoy conversations like this about topics that are on the forefront of service design and that help you grow as a professional, make sure you subscribe to the channel because we bring a new video like this every week or so. That about wraps it up for the introduction. And now it's time to sit back, relax, and enjoy the conversation with Jillian Powers. Welcome to the show, Jillian. Hello, Mark. Nice to see you. Nice to see you as well. Uh, we're going to continue on a topic that um, sort of has been introduced quite recently by a good friend of you, I think, uh, Carly Burton. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. for the people who uh, haven't seen that episode, see. yeah, it's yeah. about it's, <laughs> it's going to be about AI. Um, and if you haven't seen that episode, it's, I think, 152. Uh, maybe we'll get into your connection with uh, Carly in a second, but for the people uh, who don't know who you are and haven't looked you up on LinkedIn yet, could you give us a brief introduction? Sure. So, Jillian Powers, nice to see, uh, see everyone. I am the responsible AI head for Cognizant uh, Technologies. So what that means is I work internally as well as for our clients to make sure that the artificial intelligence that we build and we support is fair, robust, transparent, and ethical. Wow. Already so much to talk about. Uh, and uh, now uh, I don't think I asked you, but what is your connection with uh, Carly? Just out of curiosity. Um, we just know each other through through the grapevine and through our experiences working in this industry and working on service design and being at that sort of intersection of product and math and outcome. Uh, I think those are topics that I haven't heard a lot on the show and the listeners neither. Uh, math product maybe, uh, but uh, this is going to be fun. Jillian, uh, a tradition here on the Service Design Show is to do a lightning round. I've prepared five questions for you. Uh, right. Your goal is to answer them as briefly as possible. So we'll get to know you a little bit better as a person next to the professional Jillian. Uh, are you ready for the five questions? Let's do it. All right. What's always in your fridge? What is always in my fridge? Uh, vegetables and cheese. Mm. What's your favorite holiday destination? 
Um, my favorite holiday destination is anywhere where there's a beach. <laughs> All right. Uh, what was your first job? My first job was a uh, postdoc at uh, Washington University in St. Louis in American Culture Studies. Hmm. Well, I guess like that was my first academic job. My first job job was a camp counselor at the age of 13. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, which books or books are you reading at this moment, if any? That is a really great question. I'm reading... Where is it? I put it over there. Hold on. It's like it was right next to me for the longest time. I'm reading Queer Failure mm. uh, by Halberstam right now. Okay. We'll add a link in the show notes. And the uh, final question, fifth one, you're doing awesome. Uh, do you recall the very first time you heard about service design? I did. I, I definitely remember the first time I heard about service design. I was working for Idea Couture and we were doing a lot more service design work. Uh, so I come from an insights background. Uh, where I do mostly qualitative research for business development, for technology design. And we we started doing a lot more service design projects. And it just, my 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 mind opened up and my eyes opened up and it was the most exciting thing. Cool. Yeah. Uh, we've had uh, Idris Moody on the show as well a uh, long time ago. I think it's uh, one of the first 50 episodes, uh, founder of Idea Couture. Uh, so uh, cool. Uh now, let's jump into uh, the topic of today, uh, Jillian. I'm so excited to explore this because I recently put out something on uh, LinkedIn um, about AI, machine learning. I really feel that we're on the verge of a revolution within the design space. Um, I, th I feel that AI is going to uh, help to aid in the design process in a way that it's never done before. We I see that AI is being... Um, framed a lot about in conversations around how it can help in the uh, final service or like how services are going to be AI driven. But I'm really excited about the potential where it actually is going to aid in the design process. Um, not sure if we're going to talk about uh, that today, but uh, you at least uh, um, got my mind sort of inspired and it's firing on all cylinders uh, of where this can go. Now, uh, this was a long introduction, but uh, we're going to address uh, two topics today or sort of uh, merge them. Um, you're uh, deeply into the topic of ethical AI. And the other one uh, that you mentioned is let's demystify data science. Am I correct? Yeah. Yep, let's talk about it. I'm, I'm <laughs> down. Let's have that conversation. So um, both topics are really interesting. For me, uh, data science, it feels like something that I see all over, but uh, in my bubble, it's sort of, I haven't taken the chance to really deep dive into uh, it. Um, I'm curious, how did you end up from uh, your background as an anthropologist, uh, right? Researcher? Sociologist. Sociologist, yeah, researcher. correct. How did you end up in this world of data scientists, engineers? Um, can you share that with us? Definitely. So I am a qualitative sociologist. I work with small sample sizes. I do interviews. I do participant observation. I do ethnography. I do design thinking methods. Like th that's my bread and butter. Um, but when I was in grad school for my PhD, I went to a very quantitative department where what they did mostly was statistics and survey research and demography. So I spent a lot of my time with math people who um, sometimes disparagingly said, oh, that's really nice. You tell cute little stories. Um, jokes on them. Cute little stories are how the world works, right? Cute, cute little stories are how people understand other people's experiences. So I had this background in really understanding what um, a, the quantification of information really looked like from this side of it. And because I was in a quantitative department, I always wanted to do something that fit within my advisor's work, but it was never the type of things that were, were exciting to me, the types of questions that were asked and the type of data that we had access to. They, they, we always had to use proxies for types of information because we didn't have access to what I wanted. So I was like, you know what? I'm just going to go spend time with people. That's how I'm going to get my information. And so that's really the beginning of all of, of, of how all this happened. And then as I started working in UX, as I started working in insights research, I just saw how important numbers were for things. Mo more than one time in my career in uh, business, I've had people say, Jillian, this is a highly persuasive story, but you need to throw some numbers behind it. They don't need to be real but you need to throw some numbers behind it. And that just blew my mind that we have this idea that math and numbers are the abject capital T truth. 
And so what I really work on is how do we just demystify that? What do those numbers actually mean? And how do we use the right ones for the right work that we're doing? So if we're not actually thinking about the service that we are creating an artificial intelligence application for, if we are not thinking about all of the users and how they interact with things, then what are we actually doing here, right? Like we, we, we forget a giant part of this. So to demystify data science, it really is to take it back down to the level. What are we actually trying to accomplish, right? The data science is a tool. It is a way to accomplish something. So we don't really need to get into the weeds of the math. We don't really need to know all of the sort of intricacies and the details. And honestly, like when it comes to artificial intelligence, we have all these black box models. We can't. The data sets are also too large. We can't. So what do we do with what we have available to us? And that's really what I work on. Hmm. Um, and what kind of questions uh, are you uh, thinking about these days? So what's, what's keeping you awake uh this time of year well, there are a lot of things <laughs> that are keeping me awake uh well what i love to see about the this industry and the space right now are things are actually finally moving so um we are seeing legislation we are seeing frameworks develop we are seeing people go from principles to practice so instead of just saying we would like to make sure that our ai is unbiased and transparent it's like okay well what does that actually mean how do you make your AI unbiased? How do you make it transparent? And how do you also protect enterprise level secrets and proprietary information at the same time? So the types of questions that are keeping me up at night are, um, what are your accuracy levels and do you have multi-objective outcomes so that we make sure that we can protect people at the same time? Hmm. Hmm. So uh, I feel that we need to uh, go back a few steps. Uh, and um, first of all, uh, we, we, quite loosely use the the concept of AI let's let's uh, let's give it some substance w what what do you see when you talk about AI what do you mean okay this is a great question I start every conversation this way I am not talking about robots with brains or human robot brains or robot human brains we are not talking about sentient computers this is not the conversation we're having well Google had that conversation about is this artificial intelligence sentient the answer is not it's a really good pattern matcher right that's really what this is it has so much data so what, what artificial intelligence is, it's complex math built on really large data sets to give you pr the probability of a, of a correct response. Sometimes that's easier and we sort of, we, we, we just let it fly by us. We don't even see that it's happening in our lives. For example, um, the predictive text filler in your email, the, the light, the, um, the automatic light that takes a picture of your license plate when you're driving and you're speeding through a red light. Those are artificial intelligence, right? That, that's an automated process using big complex data to get an answer. So it's probability scores. It's these large language models that's, that can sound like they're sort of human. Um, it's picture matching, right? There's a lot of computer vision in artificial intelligence. So it really is, okay, here's a picture. We've shown you a thousand other pictures of a horse. Is this a horse? It's things like that. And uh, I'm happy that you sort of uh, shared this because I think uh, like the one of the first steps is to really understand and unpack this term AI. What, a, what does it mean? What can we do with it? Where is it applied? And like you said, it's already like very prevalent in our lives in a lot of areas that we just haven't yet maybe labeled or identified, which in a sense is a good thing. I guess when technology becomes transparent, it gets adopted. So uh, that's good. But um uh, we have to understand how yeah that the uh, and i like that you uh sort of made it um more tangible by saying it's uh object recognition or it's text generation or uh, it's it's things like that it's more concrete than like the the, yeah. the broad concept of the ai robot brains exactly right <laughs> and i feel like sometimes that conversation gets in the way of the harm conversation too because if we're sitting there thinking if google created a sentient you know chat bot we are not then having the conversation of um well how and what is the environmental cost of that model where is that model going to be used what are the biases within that model um all of those conversations then get thrown to the side because we're having a conversation of does this thing have feeling or not which it doesn't it is pattern matching right it has a giant database of information so based on all of the things it's seen before it can figure out how to respond to you in a way that makes it sound like it's human yeah yeah or it can recognize images or it can generate text yeah. and, and like uh i I'm sure you you've had enough of this, but the most uh, uh, common example, I guess, is the the chatbots or the 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 assistants that you interact with that where you sort of send in a message and then you get a reply and it should feel like a conversation. Like that's that's the 
kind of things that are enabled through AI models. Yeah. Right. And this is where the service design parts of it come in too, because let's say we now want to take one of those chatbots or those large language models and we want to apply it to a specific area. Let's say healthcare. Well, what we're what if the data that this uh, chatbot or this model was trained on doesn't have, let's say, women's health information attached to it? We might then get really poor examples and poor outcomes in that way. So as we're thinking about how to apply these types of artificial intelligence tools, when it either computer vision, right, where it understands pictures, any sort of biometric identification, or if we're using these large language models or we're using advanced analytics, what is the application we want to put it towards? And does it have the value and does it know enough of the information for that specific use case to then provide really good answers. I feel that we're going to make this in sort of AI 101 <laughs> episode, which uh, which is great because you, you um, uh, mentioned uh, something that is quite important, how the model is trained. Um, I sort of am starting to scratch the surface to understand what that actually means. But can you, uh, again, um, sort of exemplify yeah. what is that? What it, Okay, so this is the other part of artificial intelligence that I think doesn't get that gets short shrift in the world, right? That while we think of it as automation, that we're making robots and computers do all this work for us, what that really does mean is that there's a whole bunch of people on the back end doing different types of work now that they weren't doing before. So let's say we take that large language model. Um, and then we now want to apply it to your specific business use case. Well, we have to train that model. Now we have to tell we have to tell this model, no, you got that one wrong, you should try again. Oh, you got that one wrong, you should try again. So every time you do that, you're adding another layer to the model, which will hopefully then increase its accuracy. So what you're, the, what training really means is we take one of these models that is basically like a complex computational outcome, right? It's math, it's computer math. But then what we say is, okay, you did that thing wrong, do it again this way. Oh, you did that thing wrong, do it again this way. I'll give a great example of why this matters. Let's take the COVID-19 pandemic. Data was changing every two weeks. Right. Every two weeks, things were going were, were changing when it came to COVID. If we had a, a health model that was based off of four month old data, we were not going to understand how the virus was spreading. We have to train that model based on new data very quickly to be able to then understand where things were going. Right. So this is also why AI is also not static, because we have to bring in new information to make sure that we could in, we could maintain the accuracy rates that we're looking for. Or at least be aware how like like you said, which data served as input for the predictions that you're getting out of it. Uh, Completely. Right. And uh, like, again, uh, <laughs> it's, I, I'm, I'm trying to translate this in layman terms, but uh, like uh, the first stage is in, in training these models is when you serve a lot of photos and you want to ident you want the model to identify cats, you sort of have to help the model to understand, okay, this is an image with a cat. You do that like a lot of times at the start and then at some point hopefully the next time you put in an image it will tell you if this is a cat mm -hmm. or not the reason why i'm saying this is um the data that you put in and sort of uh the uh yeah the training that goes into it and the response that you want to get out of it that's super important like that's mm -hmm. that's key to uh the the quality of the outcome of the model completely right like I'm, I'm sure you've heard of the phrase garbage in, garbage out. That's so important when it comes to artificial intelligence and machine learning. So let's take that example that you gave of let's identify a picture of a cat. Well, if every single picture that we put into that program has a cat indoors, they might, they might not, the, the, art, the, the machine might not be able to tell a picture of a cat outside because they've associated indoors with cats, right? So it's not a human brain, right? It is a computer trying to make predictions and connections. We don't know how that works. It doesn't have the same sort of logic and context. It doesn't live in the world like we do. It didn't go to kindergarten or get raised by parents, right? It was not explained how like ethics or decision-making works, right? Um, all, all of those sort of un unseen cues that we get because we live in the culture and we live in the world, computers don't get that. So they make silly like responses sometimes. And uh, I'm getting excited about this conversation because you mentioned culture. Like uh, that seems that's uh, it seems to be me to be to very hard to embed in a model like that, or it's uh, implicitly embedded, which is maybe even more dangerous. This is what happens, right? Because all information is not. Um... Like all information has a little bit tinge of subjectivity to it, right? We the, this idea of abject truth, right? Like we numbers do matter and they are they are solid, but 
we shape the answers that we get, right? And so it might not be intentional, but our biases do come through in this. So the best example I can give here is, let's say we're using, we're training a model to identify content on the internet that we don't want minors to see. But let's say that that training now is being outsourced to a other country that has a different sort of cultural understanding of what is appropriate and not appropriate, then all of a sudden now we're going to label homosexual content as not appropriate for children, right? That happens. So we have to be really careful about who does our labeling, who does our training, how are we structuring our information, and then what what is the outcome that we're driving towards? So there's, there's so much... Um so much areas where things can go wrong or at least where you uh, need to be very aware of what's happening like once a once a model is there uh, and you input something out of it I can also see that you have to be um, like the outcomes that you get don't take them as truth that I see that I can imagine that that's also like one of the big pitfalls well, that's the biggest problem too. So there's two sort of problems here that I work to, uh, to really help people get around. Number one, we all had math education growing up and we all have sometimes a little bit of blocks around understanding math, right? Like it was a little triggering. We have some trauma responses around it. So math overwhelms us. The other part of it is when we see a number, we assume that it's truthiness, right? We assume that it's true. So let's say I am some sort of medical professional and I'm a tech, I'm a, I, and, I, and I see a number. Well, it might not actually resonate with the experience in the room, but I'm like, well, the computer says it's there. So therefore it must be true, right? So you're totally right. Like I think the, the first thing I always ask people to do is every time you see a number, how is it being constructed? What does it mean? How is it being created? Where does that information come from? We have to start questioning some of the data that we get. And uh, that's in general a good practice when you see numbers, <laughs> even when they are not generated by a computer, but also by your colleagues, Absolutely. probably. Uh, and uh, I that that sort of um, notion that uh, computers are subjective. I guess yeah. we, uh, to a certain extent, like code is law, like those kind of things. Uh, that feels like, yeah, it's it's coming out of the computer. It must be true. And then I guess in some cases it uh, it follows the standard process and it's always true. But especially in these um, opaque, uh, amorphous, predictive models, it can go anywhere. Well, for the most part, it, it can go anywhere, but it, it goes it goes where it goes based on the rules that it's been learning, um, and. It's, it's, it's up to the humans who are involved in all of those processes to understand what it does, how it works, and what the harms might be, right? Like that we need to understand where this might fail. And it doesn't mean that you don't release something, right? Like I've had this conversation before. Um, what is the cutoff and what is the threshold for releasing something when we know that it has certain types of failures? It just depends on what those failures are and how you plan on addressing them. So... Um... Another analogy, and, and uh, let me know if this makes sense or if it uh, completely doesn't. Like, uh, if we would take a, a judge in um, in a jurisdictional system, we trust that person because they went to law school, they know the law, they know how to, they have certain norms and values. When they make a judgment, we trust that it's the right thing to do. So we've outsourced that judge making to them. Um, we, we sort of do the same with these uh, models that are trained on a set of data without actually uh, sort of having that line of credibility of uh, <laughs> this model went to law school and it adheres to a certain standard. Does that make sense? So one of my mentors made this comment and I still use this all the time. So when is it unethical not to use AI? You bring up a really great point, right? So we know that there's some actions that people don't do the best at because we do have biases. Let's say hiring, right? We, have, we are really bad at being able to understand that when we say this is a good fit, what we're really saying is this person is a lot like me, right? So when is it unethical for us not to use an AI, right? Like an artificial intelligence or a computer and a data generated outcome can be less biased than our human responses, right? There are some problems that I, as one person, cannot look at that much data and keep it all in my head. A computer can help me with that. So there's a lot of opportunities to think of, when is it unethical for me not to use this technology to help get me a better answer too? Mm, I like that. I like that way of thinking. Um, so uh, we haven't uh, really touched upon how service design plays a role 
uh, in this. You, I think you definitely see a role for service design and the service design community. Uh, I'm geeking out just on the on the data stuff and the modeling stuff, but um, can you take us through like how do you see service design interacting with this subject? There's two ways. The one is how do we even understand and present what math and outcomes look like to people? So what is the um, experience and the service and the design of the actual application? And then the other one is the use and the utility of the types of models that we have to begin with. So the service design can come in at the point of any sort of data pipeline, right? If we're thinking about an enterprise and how they use information and how they're trying to create outcomes and use cases. Well, service design has to be in their room, right? Because I find that the technology and the data science are leading. So people are like, oh my God, this is so cool. We have this large language model. We should just build 75 million chatbots. Well, nobody wants more chatbots. Like I hate chatbots, right? Like what what is the use of that, right? What is the service that we need to design? And then if we think of it in that framework, right, that user focus, then we understand who we're designing for, what needs to be there and how to use the technology. It doesn't become technology led. It becomes like a like challenge led and outcome driven. So, um, and this, I think uh, uh, something that we've heard more often, designers and service design professionals, uh, are capable of asking other types of questions that aren't being asked enough right now in these in the developments of these technologies, services, solutions? Completely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think service designers have such a role to play in the explainability uh, space of artificial intelligence as well. Because so what I see, um, because math, as I said already, is confusing. A lot of people don't get it. It's hard to make, this is really complex computer math. And the way that we explain these models, it's like, well, here's more math to show you how the math works. It's, again, not accessible for most people. A service designer can come in there and be like, okay, well, what are you trying to show with these types of outcomes? How do we present this to a business user? How do we present this to different types of people, right? So when we're building master data management profile uh, programs in enterprises, if we're figuring out how data flows through an organization in ways that protect privacy, but allow people to develop AI within their, um, their business units, how does that work? How do we understand the information that we're getting? I think service design is a great role there. Uh, again, because it brings in the user perspective, right? That's so. Um, I, I'm curious. Like, is there a? You already shared many stories, but do you have a, an example where sort of the lack of um, that focus on the user led to things going wrong? And maybe an example where they did work out or where it worked out better. I think there's so many, right? Uh -huh. I think that's the challenge. Yeah. There's so many examples, but I feel like it depends on the on the on the space that you want to go, right? So um, there's there's organizations that take a private uh, a private a privacy first framework when it comes to data capture and sharing information and also presenting that back to users, right? So I think that's a wonderful example of how we can have like a user centered understanding, right? But if we take all of these examples of these prediction algorithms. Um, we're so excited by the technology that we forget that there are people on the other end of it and that sometimes the data might be flow, uh, flawed so that we're, we, we, it, it impacts our ability to get good answers. So, um, for example, like there was a recent algorithm used to identify risk in social services delivery. What happened there is mostly minorities, immigrants and single mothers were thrown off of the rolls that led to poverty, suicide, and really bad outcomes, right? And so if we have a service designer there, you could think about, okay, how is this, or how is this model replacing the human experience? Who is being replaced here? How are they using it? Um, are, what, are the, what are the human in the loop moments that to make sure that we can protect human beings in this process, right? So service design really allows us to make sure that we keep the user, but also every single human node in the process in our mind so that we can make sure that we are being as unbiased and transparent as we can. Two questions that arise from this, like, do you feel that businesses are uh, aware of this? And if they are like, what's keeping them from bringing service designers into the room? And the second question is like from the service design community, um, where are we? Why, why, I don't know, where are we? I think it's just we're not there yet. I think it's just really new still. Mm -hmm. And I feel like data science is bringing the conversation forward, right? And again, it's because the data science seems so complex and overwhelming and mathy that they're 
it, it's dominating the conversation instead of the utility and the application of things. But I think it's going to have to come because if we're having these conversations about explainable AI, well, how do we make it explainable? Explainable for who? That's a design, right? That that requires us to think about explainable AI as a service, right? What does that actually then mean for the people who are looking at things? And how do we communicate that? And you mentioned ex the ability to explain this. Uh, do we need to explain this? Because uh, the, the reason I'm asking is if we look at something uh, transparent as a predictive text in your email program, like um, it, it doesn't seem like that needs a lot of explaining. Where's the explaining part? So the explaining is more of the black box models, the one, the, 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 the models and the applications that really have an impact and a high risk, right? So uh, a, a chat bot might not have a very high risk. Your predictive text might not have a very high risk. Um, but an, uh, an algorithm that decides whether you get cancer treatment or not, that might be a little bit high risk, right? An algorithm that decides whether you go to the, the university that you're interested in, that might be a little bit of a high risk. The job that you want, um, what productivity means, um, ent uh, exiting and entering a country, right? Any sort of biometric verification around borders. Those are all high risk applications. And so... Those are the places where you would want to have, well, how does this model work? And it doesn't necessarily mean, well, the math does this. It's here are, here's where it sort of hits. Like here are the accuracy rates and here's where it starts failing and why. I, uh, I'm learning so much here. Um, the, in many conversations that I hear, uh, because I'm not in uh, your bubble <laughs> uh, around AI are, uh, maybe frivolous or playful, or like you said, don't do a lot of harm. But when these things enter life and death situations, and uh, they are there, I guess it's already in place. Um, we should be um, maybe not worried, but at least involved and interested to to make them better or to make them as the best we can. Mm -hmm. And so there's two lanes of that, right? So there's one which is like the, the, the regulatory lane, which is coming right now, right? So let's say we have that predictive algorithm for some sort of healthcare outcome. Well, regulation is coming that's going to say, well, here's the data that this is built on. Here is the application here. Like, here is where it lives, blah, 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 blah. There's all of this information that you're going to have to collect for regulators. But then the part of it is what you need to demonstrate to a regulatory body is going to be a very, very different information than what you might need to present for a doctor to use this or for a patient to believe this, right? And so again, that requires us to think about how information is shared with these different types of populations. Yeah, so a, a, a doctor, um, they, might, they might need a reading manual or a user manual or understand the limitations or the biases in the system or like how to interpret the data because there is still some interpretation even though you get a, no a number like 0 0.06, what like, that means something and yeah. somebody still has to make a decision based on that. Yeah. And sometimes it's hard, right? Because it, again, like this is, there's a lot of like sort of computational pieces about this that involve either black box models or, or even just sort of highly compl like complicated statistical models. And we might be using them together, right? Like one, what, like this is where I think the service design comes into it. Like if we are building a service from end to end, you might be using more than one AI application in the delivery of that. And how those two things then work together is going to be important as well, right? So you might use a, um, you might use one piece of AI ML to do um, like document or image scanning or recognition of, of sort of categories and tags. You might use another one to create a chatbot, right? There's other, there's a lot of pieces of that will be at, at play here and all of them you have to understand together for that one sort of journey or workflow. One of the things I posted in on LinkedIn where I think uh, these technologies can aid in the actual design process is was an example where I thought, well, we talk a lot about um, user personas or customer avatar, stuff like that. And I was thinking like, could we use text generation to actually write a rich story to sort of immerse ourselves in this person? Um, I think we can, and uh, this is definitely going to come and aid in the design process. But while now talking to you, I realized that uh, it's going to be very important to understand like who is writing that story based on which information. Because, like you mm. said, it it might be uh, very one-sided, colored, uh, um, uh, the opposite of inclusive, the opposite of diversity. Like, 
things I, I, uh, that haven't crossed my mind yet, but yeah. Any comments on that? Yeah, completely. Right. I, I, but I, as you were talking, it makes me think too, then that the, uh, if we use an AI and ML to build personas, one, number one, totally doable, not outside the realm of possibility right now. Um, if we had a whole bunch of data about, let's say the types of, uh, assets and artifacts that, uh, insights researchers collect to then build personas, like your field notes, like your recordings. And then we had a whole bunch of personas that we could show a computer. This is what we're trying to generate. They could totally do that. It's 100% doable. Um, does it lose a little bit of the, the sort of creative part of it? Like what I love about building personas is I, I call it like, um, I, I build like sort of like user and like, uh, like user fan fiction. I build these composites of people and I, I try to bring them to life with all of these little details across a whole bunch of people. But you can get some of that from a computer. But again, if the data that goes into it is biased, then the outcomes that you get are going to be biased. And 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 this, um, I'm sort of make, going to make a contradiction with myself and agree with the other point you mentioned is um, as a researcher, you're biased as well. So uh, oh, completely. Maybe, maybe uh, like your AI model would even do a better job of making sure that uh, your personas are more inclusive, more diverse, more. Uh, so uh, coming back to your question, is it actually uh, unethical not to use AI in the design process? Mm -hmm. That's, yeah. I feel like at personas possibly, so the place where I think it's important, so I'll, I'll, let's go back to this healthcare model because I feel like the the places where we see the most bias are in um, healthcare data, financial data, and any sort, and any of these like opportunity spaces, right? So um, anything like things like access to college and, and education, access to jobs, um, it's because the data that we have access to is biased. So for example, we were, we build all of these credit card models um, based on data from like the 70s and 80s when women were not um, either in the workforce at the, uh, at the same rate or were not a have, having access to credit at the same rate. So that means we're not going to give credit to women at the same rate because of our models are biased, right? Our large language models are built off of Reddit data, which is a cesspool of information, right? So they're going to go... That, that means it's very easy to get them to become racist. So we have to think about that then when we build. So let's say we want to, as a service designer, build a model that can address our biases. We have to understand what those are so that the data sets that we then provide are at our, our model, our, our, our machine, are, are, are more robust than we give them credit for. And even in that process, we can make things more biased. So for example, we just we have a data set for kids who are going to go to college. We have um, only about 10 to 15% minority representation in that data set. So you know what? How about we just double it? We'll just take those numbers and we'll just double it. Now we have we have we have more representation. However, though, we've now reified the challenges within that because that that information itself might have been problematic and not representative. So you have to be really careful about then how we build these data sets to understand how we how we could then even in our processes of trying to do better, we can still add more biases to the to the table. Um, like it, it feels like uh, that uh, ball of <laughs> ball of wool that's getting like the spaghetti. It's like when you pull at the one end, something on the other end moves. Uh, and uh, yep. it's um, I, I guess it's uh, it's not it's not linear. Maybe that's what I'm trying to get at. You sort of have to take everything into context at once. Maybe that's one of the reasons why designers are also sort of good with this. We like complex. Completely. We like complexity, and we sort of. Uh, yeah, enjoy enjoy that challenge. Um, the other thing uh, we sort of I, I feel uh, didn't yet get to is um, so where are we? Uh, as in, why aren't we yet part of the conversation, or maybe not to the rate we could be? Um, and to add to this question, uh, like, what do we need, what do we need to learn to? Um, gives ourselves give ourselves uh the right to, to the, what is it the right right of right of passage to to enter in these conversations to to be more grounded i just i i think it's just jump in right because i, I that's i think one of the biggest challenges that AI, ai and ml they feel like this mystery space that is so overwhelming um and the it's not for us or for for service designers but 
all of if all of these models are in application, if all of these models want to go live in the world, right? Business units and business buyers and 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 big executives want to put this out there, they need to think about a service designer because how this works is totally based on how it engages in the real world. So if we are basing our data off of information that let's say you get from the doctor's office and a service designer discovers that the doctor doesn't collect this information, maybe the front desk does, and the person's not involved, they're just doing it based on their own ideas, it helps us understand what this information actually says and means and how it's used. And that's not part of the conversation yet, right? So service designers should be there. There's a need for it because how information comes in, how it is then applied, and then what it means on the back end, right? That, that whole sort of end-to-end -end understanding of the application is so valuable. And uh, you mentioned we should just jump in. Easier said than done, maybe. Like, oh, completely. Uh, <laughs> if it's that easy, where uh, what's holding us back? Um. I, I don't think anything's holding. I, mm -hmm. I think what's holding us back right now is the the challenge of, of being invited into the room, right? That that the idea of the human centered end to end experience has not really uh, we're not there yet, but we should be, and we have to get there because as these models get used in doctors' offices, as these uh, models get used to identify people for for loan repayments, um, as these models get used for marketing, right, to even create cultural content or, or to identify populations and do, you know, personalization and things like that. We service designers need to be in the room. And honestly, data scientists want this, we struggle for this, because the challenge also is you have a great model, how do you show its value, you need to build dashboards, you need to build applications. And so service design needs to be there, right? I just actually replied to an email from a colleague um, because they were just like, well, how, how, where have we built dashboards? And I'm like, we need this conversation because the challenge of showing the value of a lot of these models when we have new ones is how does it work? Who, who has access to it? Who sees it, right? How do they understand it? So all of that is a service design question. Mm. And, uh, is I, I totally can see this. I eventually, this is just another technology. It's pretty cool technology, uh, yeah. but uh, it's it's about the use and the unlocking the potential and making sure that it's used in the in the right way. And it definitely seems that understanding user needs uh, helps there. Uh, what are I'm, I'm curious. Uh, you said we should be we should get invited into the conversation like when do you get invited into the conversation like what's the what's the trigger when people start reaching out to you that's a really great question so the trigger i get is uh how do we get people to say yes to this data capture which is never the right answer they're never, they're never the right question it's like what do we have to do to, to get people to say yes so we can collect information on them this way so we could build the training data to make this application and my response is i i can't give you that information because your use case is wrong right so a lot of it is that a lot of it is help us make sense of this so um let's say like legal and compliance really wants us to show x y and z but we can't so how how, how do i get brought in the room to be like okay we want to be able to br bring this model to production but um, we're getting all of these roadblocks in our way, mostly um, from different parts of the organization. So how do we get people to say yes? Or the question is, I have this model. It is complete trash. The accuracy rate is so bad, but we have spent millions and millions of dollars now doing this program because we were so excited about the opportunity. Someone gave us this wonderful presentation and it was like a little bit of snake oil. And now we have this $4 million AI program and it, the outcomes are really, really bad. So how do we retrain? How do we retool? How do we fix? So that's how I get brought into the room. I think it's a really good question. So I'll give an example. So there is a, um, a, bio, an, a biometric identification program that looks at your face if you are a contract worker um, working on legal documents. Right. So every time you jump into the program, it looks at your face to see if you have access. Right. It's like a, uh, to make sure that no one else is looking at these incredibly secure documents. Well, this model is really bad on brown and black faces. It's really black, bad with like black hairstyles, which means that if you have a whole bunch of contract workers who are brown and black, they're going to now spend way more time just trying to get into your application than doing their job. That's a service design problem now. 
it seems that, uh, it, and, and we've seen this more often in uh, the service design space, that it's good to start where, um, to find the opportunity where things go wrong. And it sounds a bit, little bit like that's also uh, a common scenario where you get invited in, like something doesn't work, like people um, people struggle with something that, that they should have fixed, like from the start. Um, have you seen, is there a list of like moments for entry or challenges with AI where sort of uh, service design professionals can latch onto? Like if they signal, hey, my, I see that they're working on AI inside my organization. I've not been invited to the first conversation where I should have. Now I just need to monitor when <laughs> like the data uh, gathering will start and then sort of start knocking on those. That would be a, a super helpful <laughs> overview. It's coming, right? So this is the challenge, right? I think you're totally right. It's coming though, but where does it come from? So when it comes to the responsible or ethical AI space, right? So it, it's it's a little bit top down, which means then it has to then like get its way into different places. So a lot of this is coming from like legal enterprise parts of the business because they want to be on top, on top of compliance. But service design is how we get things done, right? Like it's how we make sure that you have all of the access, that you have all of the, the user buy-in for a lot of these problems and a lot of these challenges. So I think it's at the ground floor also, though, when things start breaking down and go wrong um, and everything in between, right? Like there's value and there's a there's a desire for, for an end to end. If I think about um, what I see, it's like... Um, Service design is a wonderful place to be like, okay, well, what is the minimum viable product here? Like, where's the accuracy rate that we need to capture to make sure that we can do this? And that's, I think, where this is necessary. Who, it definitely seems that you care about uh, ethics and uh, the biases in these models. Um, but it seems like somebody inside the organization, like the business stakeholders, and now it's legislators that are starting to care. Um, how do you, what have you seen to be good arguments to convince business stakeholders to get you into the room early on? Um, it's good business. This is the whole thing. It's like, if you are, if your out, if your algorithms are biased, you are leaving market share on the table. Like it, this is just good business, right? These programs cost so much money. Artificial intelligence is not cheap. It requires a new type of thinking, a new type of way of looking at your numbers and new types of uh, technology and services that you all start implementing, right? Your data pipelines, your massive data management, your hyperscalers, they're all in the room for this conversation. So it costs some money. And so if, don't you want to do it right the first time, right? I, I kind of a little bit sometimes feel like a mob boss here when I'm like shaking people down, right? Because it's like, it would be a shame if your model had to get thrown in the trash, which has happened. There have been court rulings that said your entire AI program must be scrapped because your data was, was problematic. You collected information on minors and you didn't realize you were doing that and you shouldn't have, right? So there are all of these ways that if we're playing fast and loose with this new technology, you might get a slap on the wrist and it might hurt your brand. It also might hurt you uh, financially because you're gonna be taken to court. So the, the business case for this is do it right the first time, save yourself some money, have more buy-in, get people in the room um, because the data exists for us to do things right. It seems like it's almost like you're bringing in a new employee in the form of a computer in into the organization. You want them to do a good job and to the best to do the best job and not to have to fire them like after the first day. And uh, like service design can help with the onboarding and, and sort of the training and making sure that you actually uh, are getting good value out of this new colleague. Um, and and I guess it's not more than that. It's it's some it's something that is helping to achieve a certain goal. I, yeah. yeah, and I think the other part is, the other thing that people are struggling with, and this is where I think service design could be super helpful, is adoption. So everyone wants these programs to be adopted. They want people to use the technology that they're building. Um, but sometimes it's really hard to get people to change what they've been doing, right? Like even their data science teams are not running in the cloud, they're running on-prem. So how do you get your data science teams to use the capabilities that you have now spent a whole bunch of money on because you have Azure or you have like a Google Cloud service, right? There's all of these new capabilities. So there's a great opportunity for service designers to lead to, to, to drive that change as well. Now, um, 
But somebody got inspired uh, through this conversation. Uh, I know I have. Like, what would be a good starting point if you're like, yeah, uh, I love service design and this also seems like a domain that's super exciting. Uh, I want to be on the forefront. Like, where do I start? Which books do I read? Which, which videos do I watch? Which people do I follow? Like, uh, any tips on that? Um, that's a really great question. I feel like there's a lot of movement right now. Like the algorithm of justice league is a great place to start. Um, weapons of mass destruction is a book that I recommend. Anatomy of an AI is a great book that I recommend if you want to have a sense. So this is, I'll, I'll give like my background of why, where I think service design and AI really sort of join and the place where I had one of these moments of like, aha. So, um, Kate Crawford, who is an academic and a researcher, worked with an artist to show an anatomy of an AI. If anyone wants to look it up, just Google like, or use whatever search function that you prefer, anatomy of an AI, and you'll see this incredibly amazing document and like image. It looks like an experience blueprint to me. It is, it's an experience blueprint to me. And it shows everything from how you mine the tech, like the, 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 what, the things that you need to get out of the ground to make the technology, all the way to the end product of an Amazon Alexa. And I looked at this and I'm like, this is an experience blueprint. It's just in a different form. And it was so amazing to see that because I'm like this, it helped me understand all of those moving parts. And I was like, this is where a service designer could be so useful. How do you bring in all of these pieces that need to be brought to the table to understand how an AI application gets built and, and lives in the world? And this is one of the important parts which we started with, uh, the demystifying aspect, just having a visual and understanding like how the compo which components are there, which, which names do they give these components, uh, when are they important, why are they important, uh, it builds your vocabulary and it's like just having, I can imagine, totally can see that this image could be like a very good entry point uh, and sort of, um, yeah, like... Uh, unpack that 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 black box concept of an ai like it's not ai it's all these other things <laughs> like mm -hmm. is it is it publicly available this image yeah all if right. you just googled it you can find it and it was in the tape for a while so it's very very famous image right it's like it's art with a capital a at this point but it looks like things that a service designer could create which is so exciting to me to even think about so um Sort of heading towards the end of the conversation, I have a few questions left. Uh, you, you're sort of in both spaces, like the data science and the engineers, but also uh, have a good understanding of the design space. What do you feel are, what, yeah, what are some of the biggest misconceptions that you've seen uh, people having in the design space about the data science, engineering space, AI space? I think it's just overwhelming. For like designers when they enter the data science space right that it, it's and like i i had the same feelings too right like it, it feels like you're uh you're a little bit out of your league when you're around all these people who are talking in math in front of you and they're using all of these terms that you don't understand like when i first started my job what i i always keep a notebook by my side and the back of my notebook is just all of the words that i'm hearing for the first time i just write them all down and i just keep a running list and then about a year later, I'm like, oh, I know all of those now, right? So I think it's it's a lot of that. It's the challenge is um, you don't need to know the math. You just need to understand the data, how it is shaped, and then what it is in service to. What does that outcome look like, right? Like someone else is there to help you with the math. And I ask this all the time. I'm like, I'm going to say a stupid question right now. Like, what does that mean? Like, I'm going to ask you a dumb question. What does that mean? And it, because if we if we spend so much time letting the data science drive the conversation, we're not thinking about the application and the human use of something. And that's where the service designer is so crucial in this conversation. And so I think the biggest challenge is um, not letting the data science demystify you and, and make you feel like you can't be part of it. It's like, well, what is this in service to, right? So let's say we have um, and this is something that I've seen a few times. It's a very sort of popular um, use case. Let's let's look at images of eyeballs to identify where there is macular degeneration. We could use artificial intelligence. So a lot of like image scanning and like re uh, image review is ha is happening now. Um, and there's a lot of automation going on in that space. I don't need to know like the vectors or right like how that works. I don't need to know. Right. And then and service designers know this too, because we work on things like this all the time. If you're in like the healthcare space, like 
you're you're dealing with new words all the time to explain imaging and diagnosis and cutoff rates and prognosis, right? Those are all new things that you're getting exposed to. It's the same sort of space. What would you say to somebody uh, who's listening right now and sort of feels, you know, uh, machine learning, AI, that's just for like the big organizations, the, the Googles, the Facebooks, the Metas uh, of this world, the Teslas. Uh, I'm just here, like team of one, small company. It This isn't, it, how is this relevant to me? Is it relevant to people, to service designers in those areas as well? Completely. So in different ways too, right? Like that's a really great question because this is one of the biggest challenges of issues within artificial intelligence and machine learning. There's a concentration of power because there's a concentration of data within big tech. Um, the big tech has the stranglehold on all of these new models and all of this new opportunity because they are building it. They have access to our data at scale. Um, there are new organizations and community organizations and uh, consortiums who are working to um, fight back against that and build different type of large language models that do not have those types of biases, but that does exist. For the small company, absolutely you should be thinking about this because you have data pipelines internally. You are probably also buying third-party data for marketing purposes right now. So if you are doing any of those things, you are thinking now about data science. And so it is coming, right? Like if you are building chatbots for your customer service, if you are trying to automate your call center, um, those are all things that now involve artificial intelligence. You might not be building your own models, but you might be applying and implementing other people's models and other services within your organization. And so definitely you need to think about that as a service designer. Mm, cool. I hope many people will. Um, Jillian, if somebody uh, remembers one thing from this conversation, what do you hope it is? Um, that... AI is just complex computer math and that there are still people in this process. They're just doing different things now. And it is our job to make sure that uh, everything is fair, just and transparent. And so and bring the best value, not just to our, the business, but to communities and to people. Awesome. Uh, that's a great note to sort of end our conversation uh, on. Thanks for coming on. I really, really uh, want to uh, continue exploring this intersection between AI and service design. And I definitely am going to. Uh, thank you for doing like the sequel to Carly. Uh, this is a great addition. Uh, I hope we can make an entire playlist one day on, uh, on this topic. Um, so thank you so much for coming on. Well, thank you. This has been so much fun. I am here to evangelize about the value of ethical AI. So I'd love to bring more service designers into the fold. Awesome that you made it all the way till the end of this conversation. If you enjoyed it, make sure to click that like button and leave a short comment about your biggest takeaway. Thanks so much for tuning in to the Service Design Show. And I look forward to see you in the next video.